Hi, welcome to Chemistry 3006, uh, Chemistry Beyond the Laboratory. And now we're really going to talk about something beyond the laboratory. We're going to talk about Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. Uh, why are we going to talk about Titan? Uh, well, hang about and we'll find out in a second. And we're just going to go through some basic facts, atmosphere, uh, some of the interesting things, the surface of Titan and the instruments that have been used in the missions to that planet. Okay, why? Why do we look at Titan? Uh, it is the largest moon of Saturn, as I've said. Um, it's one of the few places where there are liquids on the surface, and it's one of the few planets in the solar system where there's a very significant atmosphere. So it's interesting to compare that atmosphere to Earth and see what we can learn. Um, so here's a picture of Titan over here, it's one of the poles down here, we'll see in a second, and you can see it's a kind of greyish, brownish uh, planet uh, with a very clear atmosphere, very thick atmosphere. In fact, uh, Titan has a huge, it's essentially just hydrocarbons, uh, so people are a little bit interested in that and other things as well. Basically, it's just an awesome planet, so people want to find out about that. So, as I said, one of the main characteristics of Titan is its atmosphere. Um, and here is a closer uh, picture of that atmosphere. So you can see this brown gunk over here, and then uh, there are various layers on this atmosphere which are very, very clearly seen. Uh, what they are, well, actually we'll talk about what they are, they're basically tholins and perhaps some particulate matter. So basic facts about Titan, um, it's actually almost all nitrogen, 98.4% nitrogen, uh, with about 1.4% methane. Uh, the rest of the atmosphere is about, uh, is mainly hydrogen at about 0.2%. So there's no oxygen. But does that mean there's no life? Uh, it's very hard to say because we don't really know what life is anyway. Um, well, essentially, life is anything that will you uh, that keeps it, it, life is can be described as any entity that keeps its entropy low. In other words, it has processes in play which uh, stop the advance of entropy, which is another technical way of saying stops itself dying. And those are non-equilibrium processes. Um, so is there life? Well, I don't know. It's got an atmosphere, it's got liquids on the surface. Um, however, the surface temperature is only 94 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and to put that in perspective, uh, liquid nitrogen liquefies at 63 Kelvin and oxygen at 52. So it's just uh, a little bit above the boiling temperature of nitrogen, which explains why nitrogen is mainly gas on that planet. Now, the atmosphere is significant, as I said. Um, at the surface, the pressure is uh, 1.45 bar. So it's one and a half times the pressure uh, of the Earth, which is, pretty, uh, which is a bit interesting, but the surface gravity is quite a bit less. It's only 0 0.14 g. So whatever that is, uh, it's about the same as the moon, I guess. Uh, which is a little bit strange. How is it possible that the surface atmosphere pressure is so intense, but the gravity is so weak? Hmm. Well, gravity really depends only on the mass of the planet. Uh, and it turns out that the mass of the planet is about 2.25 times the mass of Earth, so not very massive. And besides, uh, the planet is composed of a lot of gas, so gas is generally very diffuse and it becomes more and more compressed as you go deeper into a planet um, and of course as you go deeper into the atmosphere of the planet uh, there's less uh, planet underneath your feet and if there is less planet underneath your feet it will have less gravity okay so there's two effects uh, it's a very extended planet low gravity means extended uh, the pressure builds up very slowly until it reaches 1.45 bar on the surface and 
the very low mass means there's a low uh, gravity. So it's all, all very interesting. Um, another very interesting, intriguing thing about the planet is uh, we can't actually see what's on the surface because of this brown junk. Uh, remote sensing is difficult because the atmosphere is opaque at many wavelengths. Uh, there's a lot of molecules in there that absorb light, so we can't see it. Um, because methane uh, is a little bit significant in this atmosphere, 1.4%, um, that causes a kind of a greenhouse effect. Uh, because as you know, water, methane and CO2 uh, from your atmospheric part of, your, of this course, those are greenhouse gases and they, uh, they undergo radiative forcing. So it, basically they trap radiation and heat up the atmosphere. However, um, now Titan should be warmer, but the problem is uh, this haze in the upper atmosphere, which you can see over here, these hazes, they reflect back the sunlight and it actually causes an anti-greenhouse effect. So actually overall, uh, the surface is colder than it should be because of the Earth, uh, because of this haze. Uh, now on the Earth, uh, we have a similar sort of effect. Uh, when there is extreme volcanic activity, uh, big eruptions, some of the volcanic dust can go into the upper atmosphere and this dust reflects the sunlight and it leads to a measurable cooling of the atmosphere. Not very much, but you can see over the year it can be slightly dipped relative to what it should be. And uh, in the past, um, it's theorized that big meteorite impacts on the Earth uh, caused uh, a significant change to the atmosphere uh, and one of these events is theorized to have changed the climate so much that uh, dinosaurs uh, were frozen out of existence over many millions of years uh, which is actually relatively quick on the time scale of life so there we have it the haze on here creates the anti-greenhouse effect um, which is a little bit similar to earth and this is one of the reasons to look at such a planet with an atmosphere because we can sort of check our models for the earth climate models against um, the kind of information we can get on other planets such as Titan. Uh, there's quite a lot of, a uh, little bit known now about Titan, a little bit more known about the weather on Jupiter and Saturn. Those are easier planets to deal with because we can see a little bit down into the atmosphere. And this has a lot of haze in it. Uh, what else is in the atmosphere? There's a lot of trace amounts of hydrocarbons, uh, petrol, ethane, diacetylene, methyl acetylene, blah, 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 propane, uh, cyanoacetylene, hydrogen cyanide, a bit of carbon dioxide, monoxide, a whole lot of trace gases in there, which are all pretty interesting. So there is carbon there, uh, but it's not a major component of the elements in that planet. Remember also on Earth, that would be 77% oxygen, 77% uh, nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Uh, that oxygen content indicates um, a non-equilibrium process. Normally oxygen is quite reactive, so the fact that it's there indicates something strange. Nitrogen also, triple bond, uh, it's a stable molecule, but actually you can uh, get energy out of that species as well. So it's a little bit interesting. How did the nitrogen get there? Why is there so much? And there's carbon there, so there could be the elements of life there. Okay, so let's look at some interesting parts of the Titan uh, moon of Saturn, the largest moon of Saturn. Uh, one of the very interesting things is at the South Pole, uh, which I showed you before, if I just go back here, there's this little dimple here, that's actually the South Pole. Um, that's actually uh, uh, a polar vortex, um, basically the wind circling round and round, and it's a little bit colder. And that uh, polar vortex uh, contains traces of HN, uh, HCN, uh, HCN, uh, cy cy cyanide acid, and there are also traces of HNC, 
where the C and the N are swapped around. So you get some strange molecules here and also HC3N. Um, all of this is occurring at the South Pole. And there's rapid day-night changes uh, around here uh, of these elements. And you can see the false coloring of HCN in this case from this instrumentation. Uh, so what's going on there? Very, very strange, rapid day-night changes does tend to remind you a little bit about the ozone, night ozone, oxygen, uh, day-night cycle. But we really, we don't know what's going on there. Um, hydrocarbons, uh, and sorry, here, here we do see the day-night uh, behavior for the trace gases uh, in the South Pole, very, very rapid changes. Uh, hydrocarbons, they're thought to form in the upper atmosphere of Titan. Uh, and how does that happen? Basically, there's a little bit of uh, methane in there in a nice buffer of nitrogen, and that gets broken up by the sunlight, UV from the sunlight. Now, it's a long way from the sun, but you know the intensity is low. The reactions occur over millions of years. Uh, those UV uh, uh, photons uh, get absorbed by methane. Methane on Titan is the same as methane on Earth. That's one of the key uh, aspects of science that we sort of assume that if we can do an experiment on methane here, it's going to be the same as methane over there. doesn't matter if it's a long way away in the solar system or indeed even on a different galaxy. Methane is methane. So that forms uh, breakup products which uh, can then uh, recombine to form longer chain materials uh, in the atmosphere uh, and this uh, forms the smog it's basically photochemical smog uh, which is why it looks all brown and horrible and that's what this thick orange stuff is smog um, now the sun should have converted all traces of this methane in Titan's atmosphere into complex hydrocarbons millions of years ago. Even though it's a long way away, uh, it is a rather small planet, uh, as I said, 2.25% uh, of the Earth's mass. I think it's not quite double the size of the Moon in terms of mass. So it's not that big. Uh, it should have converted all of that methane into something else by now. Uh, but it hasn't. It hasn't. So there must be a reservoir of methane uh, in Titan, uh, perhaps under the surface, uh, uh, perhaps released by eruptions from cryovolcanoes. Cryovolcanoes are pretty much what you think they are. They're volcanoes that occur at very low temperature, and I'll explain a little bit more about them later. Uh, perhaps the hydrocarbons come from the ring of Saturn itself uh, because there are ring materials floating around in there as you know and we some of those might contain hydrocarbons as well. Uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons um, those are benzene, naphthalene or more complex ring structures uh, have been otherwise known as soot uh, to go with the smog here there are particulates have been detected in the upper atmosphere and there's a good chance, therefore, because if we have soot, there's a good chance we probably have more complex organic chemicals on the planet. Um, here are some lovely images here of, uh, uh, I think these are true, uh, maybe, no, these are false color because you can see it's, it's a little bit blue here, of the polar vortex over here. And uh, some pictures of the clouds uh, on Titan. Okay, let's talk about the atmosphere of Titan in more detail and the types of chemical reactions that occur. So uh, I've said before that the sunlight hits the atmosphere, the UV. UV uh, is a high energy uh, photon. Well, not as high as an X-ray or anything like that, but certainly it corresponds to the energy difference uh, of molecules, uh, electrons, in small molecules. So a UV photon has the capability of knocking an electron into a different energy level in a particular molecule. And you know that, you've done that in the laboratory. And basically they're colored compounds. 
Okay, so the sunlight comes in here, hits the molecular nitrogen, maybe splits the nitrogen up into pieces. There may be cosmic rays and all sorts of other things hitting the atmosphere up here. And we get dissociation products uh, and reassociation products from the methane. So the methane maybe drops a hydrogen and joins on to another methane, forms C2H2, C2H4, C2H6. So you can see how that's working. There's nitrogen in there, uh, which gets split uh, to form atomic nitrogen. It may then attack the carbon species and form HCN. So we can see what's happening over here. And of course, we get molecular ions to go with those processes. Um, C2H5, CH5+. Now, when you get these kinds of species, uh, it's more or less inevitable that we're going to get formation of benzene. Why is that? And let me just say, why is it that this light always keeps going off all the time? Um, we get, it's inevitable that we get formation of benzene because there's C2H5 species. Uh, benzene is a very stable molecule. You know it's got a pi electron cloud, it's got aromatic stability. So you know that one of the driving forces of chemical reactions is a minimization of free energy and a big component that is how stable the molecule is. Uh, another component is entropy. So benzene, in this case, temperature is very low, so entropy doesn't play a big role. It's mainly energetic considerations that play a role. So we get benzene formation and then other more complex organics, 100 to 350 Daltons. So we can get some massive things, but not in very big uh, quantities. Uh, and we also get some negative organic ions uh, of you know, larger size as well. Uh, and then all of these um, materials uh, have been given the, the special name tholins. Uh, why tholins? I don't know. Uh, Carl Sagan was a very famous astrophysicist and uh, he gave this name uh, to those particular species formed in the atmosphere, these brownish colored materials. I mean, these compounds that are found in the upper atmosphere are actually quite similar to those found in the Miller-Ure spark experiment. What those guys did, Miller and Ure, was they got a primordial gas mixture and put a few things in there like carbon uh, and whatnot and sparked it with lightning. Uh, it was not lightning, but just electric sparks to simulate lightning and analyzed what was formed and they formed complex organic materials, including amino acids. So that was a very significant and simple experiment, uh, pretty much like the one that Volta did when he electrocuted a frog's leg and saw it kick. That was the invention of electricity. The Miller-Ure experiment was, again, a couple of naughty boys zapping some gas for fun, and it turned out to be quite important which is often the way science is done. Actually, 90% of the way science is done. You write a big grant, as you probably know, many of you are writing a grant proposal at the moment, planning what you're gonna do. And in the end, what you do is you have some fun and you may often get a very big discovery coming out of that. Uh, uh, that's how science progresses often. Some most important discoveries like that which annoys the hell out of people who like to be uh, organized about their research projects. But, you know, you have to have time to explore things which are new. Miller and Ure. I'll include a link uh, to a video uh, on YouTube. I'm sure there's one where you can have a look at that experiment yourself. OK, so what I've described here uh, just then is all of this muck here is the formation of tholins. Now, um, all of these tholins uh, gradually form in the upper atmosphere and coagulate and uh, they uh, deposit on the planetary atmosphere, uh, on the surface. Uh, and uh, uh, tholins are formed at low pressure, tend to contain nitrogen atoms in the interior of their molecules. So the HCN or the HNC is, is the beginning target and inside is the nitrogen. And then outside we have uh, carbons attached to those guys. So it's sort of a nitrogen-centered kind of entity. 
little bit of comparison here between the Earth and Titan's atmosphere. Now, uh, here's the Earth atmosphere. Uh, we have the different layers here. Titan has a more complex layered structure. Our atmosphere is very, very tight around Earth because of its gravity. Um, up to 50 k, uh, 50 kilometers up, we've got pretty much uh, nothing. Uh, but on Titan, the lower gravity means the atmosphere is much more extended, much more extended, up to 600 uh, kilometers, where the temperature is approximately the same, a few hundred Kelvin. And then we have all these layers, and then the thick photochemical layer. And then we possibly have particulate rain, we're not very sure. Uh, whether there is weather. I think it's pretty likely they have some kind of weather. Uh, and then we are going to have some uh, methane clouds. We've already seen the HCN clouds and uh, the oceans. It turns out that there are oceans on Titan. The next mission to Titan, uh, there's been one already and we'll see the pictures in a second. The next mission will be around about 2025. They propose to land in these oceans, which are made of methane, uh, obviously, uh, not nitrogen, uh, not nitrogen, not none of these small molecules. But some of these molecules uh, will be dissolved in the in the in this CH4. It's basically a kind of petrol heaven. If you're a rev head, it's fantastic. Uh, methane, all you can have. Only problem is there's no oxygen to burn it with. So that's a bit sad. Uh, still, if missions uh, go down to there, they would only have to take oxygen, uh, refuel with liquid methane, and then they'd be off again. So they would only have to carry one lot of the fuel uh, to get out of that atmosphere. So it makes it very attractive, very attractive for exploration. Long way to go before to do something like that. Um, the next mission is proposed to land in the ocean uh, and have a look for life inside that ocean, which is it's it's pretty it's going to be very similar to an Earth type ocean, which is mainly water. But we've seen what the composition of the oceans in the Earth are, uh, dominated by the carbonate system. Uh, there'll be a different uh, kind of system going on there, involving uh, organic molecules in equilibrium with each other in a non-polar environment. Very, very interesting with nitrogen uh, complex molecules in there. Now calculations, um, and I'll include the paper about that, calculations have suggested that micelles can form in these oceans. Uh, micelles are essentially uh, bubbles. Uh, I've said before that cells are composed of a membrane uh, lipid bilayer, lipid is a fat, and my cells are little fatty bubbles uh, that can, well, they're not actually fatty bubbles in this case, but they're, they're made of tholins and they can form in these oceans. And once we have that layered product, we have the basis potentially of some kind of bubble-based or cell-based life. Now, the other aspect of life is energy. Uh, we've talked about chemicals getting in and out of a cell and an important aspect of a cell is active transport of materials in and out of a cell. And you can't have active transport unless you have thermodynamic sources of energy. So what are going to be these thermodynamic sources of energy for life on Titan? Well, we can do these calculations. Uh, thermodynamic calculations suggest that ethene, C2H, uh, uh, C2H2, uh, C2H4, ethene, can be uh, burned uh, as fuel uh, and they can, uh, they can be burned to methane, uh, so not oxygen, and power methanogenic organisms. So they will produce, uh, they will harness the double bond energy to produce methane. And uh, if they exist, their chemistry is going to be quite different no DNA obviously, but uh, proteins uh, with the O atom replaced by NH are possible, right? Uh, nitrogen uh, with a hydrogen on it uh, has the same valence structure as oxygen, uh, which is bivalent, 
So replacing O with NH in a protein, maybe those proteins uh, can do the job. No oxygen, but maybe there's a possibility there. Right, now let's talk about the surface of Titan in more detail. Um, the most interesting thing is the oceans. Um, and there are a whole series of lakes uh, near the poles. Uh, and you can see here, there are several of these lakes. Some of them have names like the Kraken there and all that kind of thing. So you can see this blue region is uh, all the lake like Th these are methane lakes as I've said now uh, the availability of liquid on the surface is not as great as earth 70% 30% but I mean looking at the surface here you can see it's much less uh, than a few percent so if you want to think of this as a wet or dry planet this is an extremely dry planet in terms of liquid but it has liquid and that's already very uh, interesting. Li uh, only two liquids, elemental liquids, and liquids are generally very hard to form. They don't, they don't, they, they don't occupy a large part of the phase space, phase diagram, for any liquid, uh, for any substance actually. So lakes cover only a few percent of the surface at the poles. Titan is much drier than the Earth and colder. Uh, a close-up. Uh, uh, from the, one of these missions uh, basically it dropped a satellite through the atmosphere and then it used uh, LIDAR uh, to detect surface features uh, a kind of laser radar and it's quite clear it's quite clear that there are rivers here uh, I think anyone in there no one would disagree that these are rivers so that uh, they must have there must have been uh, precipitation at some point leading to the formation of these rivers uh, and do they have liquid in them at the moment we don't know but certainly there are these rivers and they're going into the oceans over here um, almost certainly it's um, methane rain uh, so they must have had methane clouds okay so that's the the uh, liquid part of the surface uh, the rest of the surface which is the, the most of it um, it's very interesting to see some parts of the surface very nicely combed over here and you get images like this on the earth when we look at dunes on the Sahara so these are indeed sand dunes um, exactly what they're made of we're not too sure but probably small particles of water or silicates we're not too sure um, so this is a region like Sahara and the fact that there is these lines here indicates that there must be wind because you don't get dunes unless there's wind now how does the wind cause these dunes normally um, the formation of dunes on the earth is transverse to the wind uh, to transverse to the wind direction so as the wind blows in a particular direction the dunes go perpendicular to the direction of that wind um, some people have proposed that uh, because of the materials on Titan, uh, ice uh, silicates, they're a little bit more sticky, a little bit more sticky than sand on Earth. So there's a bit of a controversy whether these sand dunes are normal or transverse to the wind. In other words, the, the wind perhaps goes down the channels because it doesn't have the energy to push grains over, over, the, over and above themselves. So that's pretty interesting and you can see here um, perhaps a little rock uh, feature where the dunes sort of go around that rock and uh, that would tend to indicate that the wind flows uh, normal to uh, it goes along the channels because if the if the wind was going perpendicular you might not expect there to be dunes so close to the edge of this rock feature so it's interesting so erosion uh, does occur you can't get sand and rocks uh, uh, on the planet unless there's some kind of erosion uh, but the erosion occurs much more slowly obviously because there's not as much precipitation uh, going on there's obviously some precipitation 
but not as much as on Earth. Cryovolcanoes. There are cryovolcanoes on Titan. Um, Titan uh, is one of many moons on Saturn and as they rotate around the planet and taking into account the rings of Saturn as well, there are gravitational forces. So these gravitational forces uh, acting on the planet's core uh, cause some kind of activity and um, we don't know what that is. Um, we don't even know if there's any plate tectonics or anything like that. Um, but certainly the gravitational forces uh, will cause uh, uh, liquids or some other hot materials from the core, because the cores are normally hotter than the outside, to come up onto the surface, squeezed out between cracks or instabilities in the surface, because planets are not perfect spheres. Now what are these, uh, and this is a close-up of one of the famous volcanoes there, Tortola Facula, uh, and it's a cryovolcano. So uh, it's pretty sure that the material coming out of that volcano is mostly water and perhaps ammonia. So we have a water ammonia lava, for us it's just well, liquid, but that's pretty darn hot for a surface temperature at whatever that was, 69 degrees Kelvin. I can't quite remember. Any, just below the boiling temperature of nitrogen. That's lava, but it's actually molten on that planet. Uh, here's a close-up of what some people think the planet is composed of. You can see the nice bluish uh, methane natural gas colour there with the tholins and all the other products, the smog, and underneath here we have the surface and some representation of the different layers, perhaps uh, liquid water oceans under the surface um, as the material gets hotter and then perhaps some ice, uh, methane and rock conglomeration closer into the core. It's all hypothesis at this stage. Now is the most interesting part of the talk, the actual surface uh, structure of Titan. This is an image. Uh, the uh, spaceship came through the atmosphere, uh, landed on the surface in the middle of one of these uh, uh, riverbeds, and we can see the riverbed over here, and it, it really does look like a kind of a riverbed. So here we have rocks here, almost certainly these rocks are just ice. Of course, at that temperature, the ice is really like rock. It's really hard and it chips, and more or less it's just ice rock. And we can see some kind of silicate material. But one of the most interesting things here is if you look at this particular part here, you can see that this part below, all the way up to this rock here, is very, very smooth. So it looks as if uh, liquid has flowed. Uh, and of course, when you get flowing liquid, the smaller particles uh, tend to be carried first because they're lighter and they distribute on the bottom of the riverbed. So we have basically fine silt here and we seem to have a river boundary here and then pretty much more rocky material on the edge here. And in the distance we seem to have some low hills. Okay, so this image is very uh, compelling. Uh, as, as are the images from space to show that there is a river system whether it's still flowing, we don't know. It certainly, it doesn't look as if it's flowing at the current time from this image. Uh, this is a duplicate of the Huygens probe, uh, which I ripped off the internet. Uh, Ralph Lorenz is the character here, his web page. Go and have a look at that if you're interested. Uh, that was the the ship that landed on Titan. And, it has a lot of instrumentation in here and, and so on. It would have had some parachutes to get it down to the surface uh, nice and softly. Uh, this is a very remarkable set of images over here. As the Huygens probe comes through the atmosphere, you can see uh, obviously the intensity has been increased because sunlight's it's a bit dim, uh, but it's not uh, too bad. 
it's a, it's a dim planet, but you, we can increase the light so you can see it coming down from left to right. And now it passes through the uh, layer here and what, we, what do we see? It's pretty clear that we're starting to see uh, rocky features, mountains. It's coming down into a mountainous area. Uh, I would have supposed that the scientists would have got a bit of a heart attack when they saw that because they would have been worried that the probe would hit a mountain and that would be the end of it but it seems to have gone right through uh, one of these valleys and you can see there's rocks there seems to be some solid precipitate on there some kind of snow methane snow and there's a little bit of wear so it's yeah pretty much typical kind of stuff that you might see in the Himalaya I, uh, uh, and there are some peaks up uh, I'm here about 1.5 kilometers high so not terribly terribly high but they are mountains Okay, um, here's a little slide. Uh, I'll put this paper up for you if you're interested to read it. This is the Cassini spacecraft, uh, the current mission, and it has a whole lot of instrumentation on here. Uh, I put this here because you will see many of these things you're dealing with in your chemistry labs. Uh, here's a uh, UV-Vis IR mapping spectrometer, UV-Vis IR uh, there's an imaging sub subsystem, pretty much just a CCD camera, uh, magnetometer to get magnetic fields, all of that kind of thing, because um, it's quite interesting to see what the magnetic fields are like because they contribute quite a lot to the upper atmosphere chemistry because they direct charged particles to the poles. And there's other kinds of things as well. Um, I'm, uh, there would be a mass uh, spectrometer, GC mass spec here. Uh, just as you would see in our chem labs. Uh, Gavin Flamati uses that to identify small compounds from plants. Well, these are much smaller, shrunk down, and uh, basically detecting very simpler materials. And there are more complicated materials on there as well, peaks that need to be identified. So there's a lot of chemistry to be done here, and it's very, very interesting. Um, who will be the people working on these instruments? Will it be you? Uh, will, you will we be studying Titan from the point of view of pollution? We don't know. Uh, certainly from the point of view of life, it's very interesting. Probably not from the point of view of extracting hydrocarbons from that planet, because we ha really should stop burning hydrocarbons on Earth. Uh, but there's no reason why we can't burn hydrocarbons in space, uh, if we wanted to make a whole lot of plastic, this would be a good place to start building large space stations and so on if uh, humans are to exit from the solar system, which I'm sure they will do at some point, otherwise we'll just kill ourselves with overpopulation. And basically we just want to because we've got adventure and we want to see what's there and go further. So this is a good stepping stone, a lot of reasons to look at Titan. I hope you've enjoyed that. See you later.